Good afternoon and welcome to a webinar on common pavement maintenance techniques. We'll be starting up in about two minutes on Zoom. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar on common pavement maintenance techniques. We'll be starting up in about one minute on Zoom and Facebook Live. So good afternoon and uh, welcome to our webinar on common pavement maintenance techniques. Uh, we're going to be on Zoom and Facebook Live today. A couple of uh, housekeeping things before we get started, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, as we've talked before, the chat pod is disabled, but uh, we may put some things in there for information for your use, but uh, just so you know. So no chat pod today. But if you do have a question or something, please put it in the Q&A pod. To get to that, just drag your mouse down near the bottom. You should pop right up. And I may ask you to raise your hands now and then to answer questions as we go along. This workshop is worth one professional development hour here in New York State for engineers. In this particular case, only the person who's registered will be able to get the PDH certificate. And it is considered a course. Uh, everybody who attends for at least three quarters of the session will get a certificate of attendance. And so to get the PDH, just send us your certificate of attendance and we'll confirm your time. You need to be on for at least 90% uh, of the time. Thanks. Now, if you're from another state and you need a professional development hour, please uh, just check with your LTAP center and uh, they can help you out there. Now, for those who don't know who we are, just as a reminder, uh, update, we are the LTAP Center here in New York State, which is the local technical assistance program. Uh, but we've had a long history predating that, so you can actually see pictures of our first director, Jim Spencer on the left, and then a couple of Lynn Irwin, who was our director for over four years on the right. And I actually purposely wanted the picture on the far right, which is uh, Lynn giving Dick Rudolph his 30th Highway School Attendance Award. We also, as for those who know, he actually got a 60th Attendance Award uh, about five years ago. Now, we're not doing the highway school, but we're looking at doing some special things that week. So stand, stay tuned and look for that. So on to our webinar for today. So today we're gonna to be talking about common pavement maintenance techniques. We're gonna focus on crack repairs, patching and wearing courses, because these are the most common ones that are used here in New York State. Now we don't have a handout today, but we actually are gonna be following through a little bit the uh, pavement maintenance workbook that's for a day long class. And uh, you can download that by going and searching on the web. And the address is there, but just as easy as go to our main address, which we'll show you at the very end of the class today, and just search for pavement maintenance, and it'll come right up to the top. You can also go to the information highway and get a copy of this particular webinar and any of our webinars we've been doing throughout the spring. The other thing I would advise you to do, and I'll mention this a few times as we go through today, we actually had a series of videos put together by one of our circuit writers, Gary Nelson, and you can see a screenshot from one of them there on uh, patching that he did. But he did a series of 
videos that are available. They're about 15 minutes long to get a little more detail and a different spin on some of the stuff I'm talking about today. And together, the two of them, I think, would be very valuable for you, for those of you who are on today. Now, one thing we're looking forward to doing, we're starting to open back up uh, to get around New York State. It's a beautiful state from the beaches on Long Island to uh, Niagara Falls, obviously, in the west and lots of beauty in between. To help me out so that we're all on the same page, uh, let's make sure we know who's here and who's on today. So how many folks are at your site? Who do you work for? You can select multiples there. And then scroll down, don't forget to scroll down, and uh, how long have you been at your job, okay? And we'll try to get about three quarters of you voting here. Just helps me out to figure out uh, what I'm gonna focus on and where I might put a little more emphasis. Okay, getting close to three quarters. Okay, we'll end the polling, we'll share the results. And so most of you, as has been true for most of the webinars, are by yourself, as we're doing with social distancing, though a few of you have large groups watching, hopefully on a big screen, social distance and all that fun stuff. Most of you, again, with local governments, about two thirds, some states, some consultants, uh, there's a few honest folks who are working for the weekend, uh, as uh, Adam Howell, who's our communication specialist, and I were talking before we got started. It's hard to remember what day of the week it is sometimes, so the weekend sort of disappears on us. And then how long have you been at your job? Well, most of you, uh, about half of you actually, about uh, greater than 10 years, but that helps me quite a bit. So I'll get the poll out of the way and we'll get back onto the webinar itself. And one more thing I want to do before I get going. Okay, so why do we do what we do? Uh, this is true whether it's pavement maintenance or it's bridges or budgets or any of the things that we do. Why do we do what we do? Well, as highway departments, our primary responsibility is to help move people and goods from here to there, which is why it's been considered essential work throughout the COVID-19 uh, spring that we've been dealing with. And to get that to work, as we talked in one of the early webinars, we have to make sure we take care of the drainage the communications, and of course, we want to keep everybody as safe as possible. So safety becomes a big issue. Now, obviously, one of the things that comes into play, and it's certainly an issue which I know is hitting a lot of us, is the issue of cost. Okay, we'll give you a little bit more on cost as we go through on these pavement maintenance techniques, but it all comes back to getting the best bang for your buck. So I got some questions for you. So I'm going to put them up. And uh, in the Q&A pod, maybe you can give me a couple of answers to some of them. So let's see, uh, do you have enough money in your budget? So uh, see if we can get some folks in the Q&A pod to tell me if they have enough money in their budget. No, yeah, that's a, I suspect we're gonna see a lot of no's. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. By the way, I preloaded what I think the answers are gonna be. So I'm, I'll, I'll see. I like the person laughing, that's pretty good. Okay, let's see the next one. I will clear them first. And then we'll say, how much can we cut from the budget? So how much do you think you can cut from the budget? Nothing, zero, okay. It, we probably are. Most of us are getting pretty close to the bone. I, I can't argue with that, though I have a slightly different answer I'll give you in a second. Can you defer pavement maintenance? Do you think you can, can defer pavement maintenance? Yes, sometimes. Not close, no. Okay, and then my last one. We have the magic uh, clearing of the answers. Only if you want to get rid of a road, I like that one. What repair should we use on this road? Okay, now that one you don't have to type it in. That's actually what we're talking about today a little bit. Okay, so do you have enough in your budget? Probably not. Uh, we've done the, the math and we've looked at it. Most of us are already way under budgeted, but most of us would answer would probably be a no. How much can you cut from the budget? Well, in the short term, most of you said no, and I probably agree with you. But long term, you may have to do some cuts just to survive the crisis that we're under. 
But whether or not you can afford to do it or not comes back to what's good for the user, but that's a class for a different day. But this is one where I actually, when people ask me this, can we defer payment maintenance? My answer is always no. If I have to cut, if we're running out of funds, if we've got to deal with crisis, the last thing I'm going to cut, well, the second to last thing I'm going to cut is maintenance. The first thing I'm going to ask you to cut, not cut at all, is training, but I also know where that falls in the scheme of things. The key is we've got to do the maintenance. It's better to keep good roads good than to cut that maintenance. If you have to cut something, you actually want to cut the longer term projects, the capital work in a lot of ways. You don't get as much bang for the buck. And in terms of what repair should we use on this road? First question I always ask, how's the drainage? This is our famous picture that actually a gentleman by the name of Jay Olson took and it says, ducks are an indicator of poor drainage. Um, yeah, we gotta take care of the drainage first. So whatever we're doing, it comes back to that issue. So let's uh, remind you of something. We do have another webinar coming up this Thursday on preparing an asset management plan for your pavements, which would be very helpful for those of you trying to figure out a plan to deal with not only the short term, but the long term. And how do we deal with the budget that we have, not the budget necessary that we'd like to have? Now, again, I told you we're gonna be going through the workbook. If you download the workbook later on, or once we are able to start mailing you things, we can mail you a physical copy. Chapter three talks a lot about repair choices, okay? And Gary actually did a fourth video introducing the three major maintenance techniques. And in there, he talks a little bit about the repair choices as well, and some of the questions that we need to answer. But just as a reminder, there's lots of repair choices that should be in your toolbox. And if you don't have them all, well, you probably are missing something. So you need to have everything from doing nothing, which I really like because we're doing it right now, up to total reconstruction. But today we're gonna concentrate on the three most common, and you'll notice there's a fourth one, area repairs, which is a form of patching, which is a little more extensive, but we're gonna be concentrating on the most common maintenance techniques, not the capital work. And drainage is again, a class for another day. And we're gonna to concentrate today on, let's be honest, asphalt surface. I'd love to do a session on gravel roads. If this is something of real value to you, let us know. We are looking at our June and summer schedule, what we're gonna do or not do. In fact, I'll ask you about that towards the end of the class today. To figure out what we might do over the summer. Now, we're gonna be talking about pavement maintenance, okay? And when you hear the term pavement maintenance, you may also hear the term pavement preservation. Pavement preservation is actually something that the Federal Highway Administration through their Everyday Counts Initiative has been promoting. And the idea is to promote keeping good roads in good shape. And we get asked all the time, what's the difference between pavement preservation and pavement maintenance? Well, in short, pavement maintenance are the techniques themselves. Pavement preservation is sort of the overall plan, that asset management idea, like I mentioned on the webinar coming up Thursday, but it's to preserve what we've already got. They go hand in hand, they go hand in glove. So if you hear the terms, they're overlapping quite a bit. So I sometimes in fact purposely use pavement maintenance because it's a little clearer to understand, but really it's both. And the idea behind everyday counts and actually any of the things we're talking about is there's some new things out there, things that have changed like polymers and high pressure tires and you know these spreaders that do patching. But they're also, Things that we've learned 100 years ago that are still valid. When we were cleaning Lynn Irwin's office out, we came across some old slides and they're made of glass. They're four inches in size, as you can see. And here's the back end of a asphalt bound macadam train. And while the steamroller and the tank holding the uh, tar look a little different, the back end of that distributor looks an awful lot like the back end of a distributor we use today. So keep that in mind that we, want to take advantage of what we learned that's new, things do change, but we also don't want to throw out the good that we knew in the past. So what we're going to do now is go through the three most common techniques. We'll start with crack repairs. And again, there's a really good video available on the information highway that covers this in some different format than I've got. And you might go and go look at that, including some videos of actual crack repair being done. I couldn't take that risk with the Wi-Fi, though I'm going to take a risk with a couple of videos. Now, in terms of determining the type of maintenance, whether I should be doing a crack repair or not, we look at three things. We look at the crack density, we look at the edge deterioration, and we look at the crack width, okay? 
Now, sometimes if I'm not sure about the crack width, what I'll do is I'll look at all the cracks and imagine if I brought all these cracks together, how if squeezed it all to one big crack, how wide would that crack be? That's a way to help you figure out if you're not sure about the crack density. But the crack density is essentially saying, if there's a lot of parallel cracks like we see here, this is not a candidate for crack repairs. This is a candidate for a patch or something more extensive. Edge deterioration, when a crack first forms, it's nice and square, okay? So there's a sort of little edge deterioration. But over time, this edge breaks down. And as that breaks down, we're also getting breaks down along the edge of crack itself. And as that deterioration gets too bad, filling it up isn't gonna help. It's gonna continue to deteriorate. So we don't wanna do a lot of effort when the crack is already deteriorated pretty badly. So to look at that, we could make up a nice little chart that looks something like this, that essentially says if there's a lot of deterioration of the edge, if there's a lot of density, we're gonna to have to do something more than just crack repairs. Crack repairs have to actually be done sooner than most people really think they need to be done. Now, the other thing I want you to keep in mind is crack repairs covers two types of maintenance techniques, sealing and filling. Sealing a crack is when the crack is working, moving, usually thermally, back and forth, okay? In that particular case, we're gonna put in a flexible material that expands and contracts as it moves and prevent the intrusion of the water and the debris, okay? Uh, somebody asked here, does the type of crack matter? Well, that's why this density thing comes up and I'll uh, leave that question open for a minute because I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures and hopefully answer that in good detail. Crack filling, is for non-working cracks, cracks that are not moving at all, okay? In that particular case, we can get away with a little cheaper material, and all we really wanna do is reduce the infiltration of water. And at the same time, because it's not moving, instead of using a flexible material, we can actually use a material that reinforces the adjacent pavement, okay? Now, if we were doing the full day class, we'd stop now and show you a video or maybe even a couple of different videos on asphalt crack treatment that are in our video library. Again, based both on time and the fact that Gary did such a nice job, I'd advise you to go and look at the one he put together. It's got some good videos showing your crack treatment. But I can show you a couple of charts to help you figure out whether or not you're gonna seal or fill or not even bother, okay? This question about what kind of crack. So what you wanna do is look at the width of the crack. The cracks need to be wide enough to actually get a pin or a pencil into them, okay? So at least a quarter of an inch. But if it's more than about three quarters of an inch, it's gonna be really hard to get material into that, okay? For sealing it, the sealing materials. If it's more than an inch wide, there's no point in filling it. You're not gonna get much reinforcement. You're gonna to have to look at either doing a patch. You could use some of the new modern mastics that have polymers and stuff into them. But again, you're not crack repairing at that point. You're doing something more of an area kind of repair. Edge deterioration, you want nice square edges to work against, maybe a little deterioration. And in terms of movement, if it's not moving more than about an eighth of an inch, about the half, half the width of that pencil, you can fill it. But if it is moving, you need to use something that is flexible, okay? Now to prepare it, in both cases, you gotta make it clean and dry and get the debris out of the way. But in the case of sealing, you really want to route or saw it to make a reservoir for your material. Because if it's too small, you can't get the material in. Here's a good candidate. Nice and square, single crack, very little, quote unquote, density. Okay, so it's a single crack. If you were just filling it, all you gotta do is clean it out and you walk away. If you want to seal it, you might have to come in here and make that a little bit wider. Okay, now if that could be hard to saw, it can be done if it's not bending too much, but the idea is this is a good candidate. So the question comes, how about something like this? It's not alligator cracked. Alligator, it's too, too far gone. Alligator cracking, we're not gonna do crack repairs. What I like to do is just imagine in your head or heck, if you've got a picture, take a picture and start drawing all the cracks in. And imagine the crew is out there trying to fill all these cracks, okay? At some point, it's gonna not be worth it. You're gonna create more of a safety hazard than you actually are gonna fix the cracks themselves, okay? This one is probably right on the margins. It's still okay. 
you don't have more than two parallel cracks at any one location. But anything beyond that, there's just too much density, there's just too much work, and you actually could create a safety hazard, okay? Now, something you'll see a lot is you may actually see cracks that actually aren't wide enough. This is actually a reflective crack from a lower layer. And while it's wide enough in this zone right here, overall, this crack, it's probably not quite wide enough. You can see actually where they've tried to do a repair over here on the left lane, but it's just sitting on the surface. It didn't get any penetration and you're not getting any reinforcement of the adjacent material for a crack fill. And of course, there's no ability to flex if there's any movement. I will admit most reflective cracks tend to move whatever the crack below is doing. So let me ask a Q&A pod time. How many folks, I tell you what, actually we'll use the hand feature. Let's everybody raise your hand if you think this is a good candidate for crack repairs. Raise your hand. One, three, four, five. Not many, that's good. This is not a good candidate. And why don't you think this is a good candidate? What do you think in the Q&A pod? Why is this not a good candidate? Would take a lot to fill it in, yep. Secondary cracks, look at all the parallel cracks that you've got to deal with, okay? Lots of parallel cracks and it's too wide. If you put all those cracks together, that's probably going to be more than an inch, okay? And then the other thing is, Imagine if you were way down looking at it from the below, these cracks, if you did a cross section, remember we want a nice square edge. But what we really probably have here, you can actually see it. We've got this deterioration over here. It's, if you see that much breakdown of the top, you're gonna have a really hard time. And uh, uh, Mr. Nelson I see is on, he put down that it's not uh, wide enough, 0.1 inches, well, he might be right in some spots over here, but it's the density and the edge deterioration that get, get to me. And yeah, filling that all in would take a lot of time. Okay. Thanks, Amanda, for clearing that. Okay, so now let's raise our hands. Who thinks this would be a good candidate? I think you meant one inch. Yes, I know you meant more than one inch, Gary. You're raising hands, a lot of you are raising your hands. Yeah, this is actually a really good candidate for crack repairs. And yes, parking lots still, still should be crack repaired. Now, you're not gonna probably fill all these minor, minor cracks that are up here, but this crack down here, absolutely classic, good candidate. In fact, this is one we did for the highway school about seven years ago. It lasted for the entire time until they destroyed that parking lot to put in the new A&E Center where we were actually planning on moving the highway school this year. Um, so yeah, nice, simple, clean crack. Okay. So now in terms of what materials do you use for filling applications, you're gonna be using asphalt emulsions, asphalt cement, things are gonna give a little bit just asphalt when you're done to help bind those two together, maybe even some fiber in it. You could use a polymer modified material that actually has some sealing characteristics. That's why it's in italics versus sealing where you're gonna use more expensive materials, rubberized asphalts, even silicone can be used. Okay, now some asphalt rubbers are sometimes using filling operations. That's why it's also in italics. But the key is, do you need the movement or not need the movement? Okay, and in terms of configurations, well, I can tell you right now, most of us do a flush fill. That's the most common technique that we use. We put just enough to fill into the crack, we walk away. If we're doing a sealing operation, we're gonna saw and create ourselves a reservoir, okay? And everybody worries about the overbands. And I do, I worry about the overband and snow plows, but truth be told, most of us, the overbands, if we keep them thin enough and we do them early enough in the season before snow season, you shouldn't be in too bad a shape, but keep the overbanding to a limited amount. That's not really doing you a lot of good up there on the surface. In fact, speaking of which, here's an example where we should not have done crack repairs. All we've really done is made something the lawyers like, and that's about the only people who will like it because this would be very dangerous in a rainstorm, okay? You don't want to be sealing it when there's so many cracks that all the crack overbands would overlap with each other. How long do they last? Well, filling adds about two to four years to the life. Sealing another year, so you get three to five. And if you actually do a good job with the cutting, either routing or sawing, you can actually get five to seven years extended life above 
which you would expect otherwise. Of course, assuming you don't have drainage problems. Now, in terms of construction operations, you're going to cut if need be, like in the ceiling. You're going to clean and dry. You're going to install your material. And you're going to finish if need be. And then finally, you might need to blot it if you've got a lot of excess material. Now, in terms of cutting, the most common technique is a saw, but you'll also see routers. If the lines are straight for the cracks, sawing actually works really well. It gives a nice, clean edge. You can also use a router, but it does tend to do a little bit of damage to the surface. But you can't really follow straight on a moving crack like you see into this gentleman's feet with a saw. So in that case, you probably want to recommend and use a router. And again, if you go to the video that uh, Gary did for us, he's got some nice video of that actually in operation. Now, in terms of cleaning and drying, you can use an air compressor, fine. But do me a favor, if you're going to use an air compressor, make sure it's got an oil water separator on it. Otherwise, you're going to blow little micro droplets of water right along the surface. Not going to do you much good. In fact, in this particular case, somebody had used a rubberized material that's very expensive, but you can actually see it was, we were pulling it out by hand. The stuff was so non-bonded. It was beautiful stuff, but a waste of money because it wasn't sealing the crack. It wasn't keeping the water out, okay? So I actually prefer a heat lance, okay? It's essentially a propane torch on a stick. It dries it, it blows it out, it actually warms it up slightly. Again, you need professionals to do this. First couple of times, rather than going to buy one, you might want to have a company come in, do it for you the first time, and see if it's even worthwhile. But get yourself a heat lamp. In terms of material installation, work with the manufacturers. They all have slightly different techniques. I couldn't possibly show them all to you today in the limited time that we've got. But after you're done, you may get an overband, you may not. But the key is, think about the process. Okay, some people like these shoes, for instance, this particular shoe, the shoe part's working well, but I think it does need a little bit of cleaning on the stick. And then finally, you can uh, do a wedgie or a squeegee to finish up and get rid of most of the overband. And once it cures, you should be in pretty good shape. In fact, in this particular case, people will say, hey, there's a big overband. Look how thin that is. That's going to get rubbed off mostly by traffic and by winter. If you give it a month or two, you'll be fine. Okay. Now, in terms of blotting, we usually use sand, though you can see once in a while people have actually used toilet paper on a stick, though right now I suspect that might be something that's hard to find. Now, when should you do crack repairs? Well, crack repairs, actually, the best time to do a crack repair is in the middle of the season. You don't want it too hot because the crack is closed if it's a moving crack, and you don't want it too uh, wide as it would open up in the winter. You actually want to go sort of the middle. So not the winter, not the summer, but the spring and the fall are some of the best times. Wait till the temperature is above 40, both the air temperature and the pavement. Make sure the humidity isn't too high and absolutely no chance of rain. If you've got any rain whatsoever, you're going to have an issue. So you don't want any moisture in there. So one thing, don't take a chance with rain. Okay. Now we're going to move on to our next favorite technique. We're going to talk about patching a little bit. And we're going to take a risk here. We're going to see if my video plays. I don't know if you'll hear it. Um, we're going to find out. If you don't hear the video, well, I'll, I'll narrate it for you. But I don't know if you can hear that or not. OK. Nope, I didn't think you could hear it. I've fought with this ca computer to get video. That's, that's Lynn Irwin back in the 70s, and essentially talking what creates potholes. To create potholes, you need two things, traffic and water, <laughs> excess water and traffic. OK, now before I move into patching, I do want to answer a quick question. Crack seal can last 7 to 10 years, but each crack is often a symptom of an underlying problem. Yep, it may be. And that's why you got to watch the cracks carefully. We'll end with a session talking about that a little bit about the fact that once the cracks get bad enough, the crack itself might work, but it'd be like welding bad metal. It's not worth doing. Now, why do we patch? Well, we patch primarily to repair a localized distress, okay? Especially with our demand patching. We try to improve roughness. We don't want something that's going to break tires. Uh, my father-in-law 
for about two years, didn't want to come visit because uh, he didn't like the uh, fact we'd burst a couple of tires. Well, he had burst a couple of tires driving down a road with his uh, vehicle. We want to reduce the rate of deterioration. And demand patching may not do that, but a semi-permanent one will. And then we, of course, may want to do some patching prior to doing an overlay or something more extensive. That's the area repairs that I was talking about. They can be very, very valuable. Now, I would not call this a patch preparing the road for an overlay. You've got to do something more extensive, and we'll talk about that. The three most common patching types is the semi-permanent, the spray patch, and the demand patch. And we'll talk about which one's most beneficial here in a minute. Now, semi-permanent, uh, we call it semi-permanent because it's just like anything. It's never going to last forever, and there's still going to be issues. But you got to go in and you got to cut the boundaries. You got to remove the old material, okay, that's broken down. You may need to clean and repair the foundation, the base layer. Apply a tack coat to bond the old to the new. And then fill the hole with your patching material, roll it, compact it. And then finally, and this I see way too often, you got to go in and you got to clean it up. Okay, so that's the process. So let's walk through that process a little bit. First one is marking the patch boundaries. And I see this and I just shake my head when I see things like this. Look, there's no point in trying to save a penny by having a shape that might be a little slight, slightly smaller, but it's hard to cut and you're gonna have a hard time repairing it. So for instance, right here, just cut yourself a square, okay? Don't try to do some weird, I'm going to cut off this octagonal shape. I'll save a little bit of money. A, you're going to spend more money on blades. You're going to wind up cutting places you don't want to cut. And it's usually not worth it. And if they, you were repairing up here at the same time, and these two holes were close to each other, heck, just do them all at once. The time differential isn't as much as you might think. Here's a classic photograph that I've kept for years. It's like, what? were they thinking? Because uh, what do you think is going to happen right here shortly after they get done? Yeah, it's going to recrack. Okay, so you cut the boundaries. Now I've got my pothole. How close to the edge of that pothole should I cut my boundaries? What do you think? How close to the edge? A foot? Yeah, I like a foot, four to six inches, six to eight. Yeah, you need to look at the pavement. I will be honest with you, there are some times you look at it and you realize I've got to go even a little bit further. While it's not quote unquote cracked, it's in pretty sad shape. But generally these edges, even if you can't see them, there's little micro cracks in here, okay? So I would go minimum six and preferably a foot, okay? You're not gonna, spend that much extra on material and you're really going to do a good job of cleaning up and making sure you get to good solid material. So that's, and that's pretty important. You want to definitely do that. Okay. So we'll do a cut, cut off saw, uh, chainsaw that they make chainsaw specifically for cutting asphalt. You cut it, you remove the material. Okay. You could use a grinder to take all that material out if you wanted to. Okay. But the key is at the end of the process, you really want to have a nice, clean, square edge. That's pretty important, okay? Now, when you remove it, generally the upper layer of the base or the layer below is also probably pretty deteriorated. So go ahead and remove some of that as well. And then bring some new foundation material in if you need to, okay? Don't assume it's in great shape. Look at the water situation, for instance. And then apply a tack coat. Now you're thinking, well, what tack coat do I use? Because if I'm on gravel, I'm supposed to use a priming material and on the sides, I'm supposed to use a, a standard tack. Hope no asphalt guys are on here. Use the tack even on the bottom. Don't try to do two different materials. You'll drive yourself nuts, especially for a square patch. Just get me a nice, clean, good coat. Some people like to use sprayers. I actually prefer the bucket method with a broom, mainly because you got to really clean that sprayer nozzle up. Or if you fail to do so, next time you're going to buy yourself a new sprayer. Okay? A cheap brush. Get the side. Don't overcoat, though. There's no need to. But tack coat. It actually is pretty important. 
Here's a patch that was outside of our building, not too far away. Uh, beautiful job on the patch. They packed it well. They compacted it pretty darn good, um, but they didn't seal that edge, as you can see. And a few years later, it began to crack uh, because water was getting underneath and you don't want water to get in there. What they could have done is they could have come back in here and treated that just like a crack. And once they started getting it wide enough, they could have sealed it. But boy, it'd been a lot easier to put a tack coat before they put it in the first place. Okay. Now, this person asked a good question. With regards to alligator cracking and base failure, has the asphalt base failed or the sub base material failed? It, most of the time we see alligator cracking, that's usually a drainage problem. There's a water issue underneath. It's usually lower down. Uh, not always. Some old pavements will look like alligator cracking, but it's usually deep down. It's usually the base or sub base or the native material, even the subgrade itself. Yeah, Gary says sub base and Gary's right. Okay. So you fill the hole, just like with paving, put a little extra, about 25%. So a quarter inch per inch of compacted depth is what you're going to need. So the depth that you're going to need. So if I've got myself as an example, I want to put down at the end of the day, oh, four inches of compacted depth. How far above this top of the existing layer should my asphalt layer be before I hit it with my rolling device, compaction device? One inch. Yeah, very good. Yeah, one inch. Okay. In fact, what a lot of people do is just like making a joint when you're paving, you can actually set yourself a depth, pour up to the top of that piece of wood, and then when you bring your roller in, you know you'll get nice, good compaction. Okay. Now, this is some video, a picture they sent to us um, showing how to compact the patch. It's a nice little device. It's fine for surface work. But how deep can you really compact with a device like this, these little vibrating compactors? How deep can that go? Nobody wants to be brave. Two inches? Maybe two? Yeah, not much. And remember, all it's doing is on vibration. The weight isn't enough. You need mass and vibration to really do it right, okay? So I would say two inch max, okay? Anything deeper than that, you might get some compaction. And if that's what you've got, do that. Don't hit it with the silly hands tool. The hand tool is doing even less. The vibration tool at least gave you a couple of inches worth of effort, okay? So if you had to do four inches and that was your tool, well, okay, do a couple of quick lifts. It doesn't take that much extra time. Do the lift, hit it a couple of times, Scarify it real quick, do a second lift, and that gives you your four inches, okay? And when you're done, you want nice compaction, but again, if you don't get enough compaction now, traffic will compact it later on. And of course, you need to clean the site up. Now, in terms of spray patching, uh, just by attendance hands here, how many of you have access to a uh, spray patch within your department? Does anybody ever have a spray patcher? I've got a couple of hands up. Three. A few of you do. Okay. These can be rented. They can be uh, leased. Or again, you might check to see if one of your neighbors has one of these tools out there. The idea is you blow the debris from the hole. You spray tack coat comes out of the same big wand. Okay. You then blow a mixture of aggregate and binder, which is actually the tack coat mixed with the aggregate comes in another bin. Then you top it off with a little extra aggregate so you don't have asphalt wandering around. And again, this is one of those ones. Go look on the information highway later on. Go find the video that Gary did. He did some really nice job of finding a couple of examples of spray patch trucks out there working. And they come truck mounted with the guys inside all the time listening to uh, Def Leppard or whatever it is he's got on the radio. Uh, they also come trailer mounted, which is better. Comes down to economics comes down to time, okay? The nice thing about these spray patch pieces of equipment, they can be used year round. They work in almost any weather, except of course, ice. And then finally, demand patching. It is our single most common pavement maintenance technique, okay? 
Now, some agencies have a 24 hour standard for patching potholes. Does anybody on the uh, webinar today have that as a standard that you're gonna fill a pothole within 24 hours after you know about it? You're either given a call or it should have been one you saw. Up uh, There's a yes over in the Q&A pod. Nobody's raising their hand. So just, just a couple of you, okay. And that's actually a, probably not a bad standard to have once you know about it, to try to get a crew out there. It could be a notice of claims issue. Okay, the state DOT, by the way, if you're with state DOT, you're supposed to have a 24 hour standard. So I hope you raised your hand uh, for fixing that. The idea is to restore safety, okay? To do it as quickly as you possibly can, to get out there and do it. But realize demand patching, unlike a semi-permanent patch, doesn't take care of the underlying distress. If you've got any kind of alligator cracking or drainage problems, they're still there. The other thing, do me a favor. This is some of the worst conditions we're in. Okay, <laughs> somebody put buy extra cones. You can do that to some extent. Uh, do me a favor, when you're out there, wear the safety equipment, wear the PPEs. You're out there usually in some of the worst conditions doing the patching and traffic doesn't want to slow down. And by the way, there may be less traffic now. Traffic fatalities have actually gone up in some places because people may be driving less, but they're driving a lot faster. Now here's an example, you may have seen this in some of my other slides I've shown this spring. This is a place where it got patched three times by three different agencies on the same road and they all used the same technique. They threw the stuff in the hole, hit it with the back of the shovel and they walked away. And you can see the patch sitting over here on the right. Every single time it just got blown right out by the traffic. And of course it gets filled with snow, it'd be hard to see and I'm, be glad if you didn't have a motorcycle because you hit that with a motorcycle, you're going to have a really bad day. So demand patching really means throw and roll. Okay. Now you can sweep the whole lot if you've got a broom, but the modern proprietary mixes that are made with polymers, those mixes are going to work even in the water. That's what they're designed to work in. The key though is you've got to have pressure you've got to compact them to activate that polymer. So the back end of your truck tire actually does a pretty good job of that. And again, one of those cases, please go watch the video. There's two reasons you want to see this one. Gary did a demo, which is pretty cool. He made little cupcakes. And we've also got a video of a truck showing you how easy it is to do. It's a really simple operation, okay? And when you're done, the demand patches may be slightly rounded up. That's okay. You don't want to trap any moisture. But yeah, I really wish we had the demos because this is one of my favorite ones. We can actually make some cupcakes out of it. Go watch the video and you'll enjoy and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Now, in terms of patching cost effectiveness, we could run the math and in the full day class we do. But let me ask you this. What do you think is the most cost effective between spray patching, demand patching, or semi-permanent patching in the winter? What do you think? Let's see what the answers are. Nobody's going to take a guess. Demand patching, semi-permanent. Well, if you can get a plant to open in the winter, Mr. Dennehy. I'm picking on you, Ed. Uh, in the winter, they found, actually, you can do the math, throw and roll, i.e. demand patching, is cost very cost effective, okay? If you have a hot box, it can work some. The key, remember, though, is the ground temperature is still going to be cold. How do you compact that material and get it to really stick and stay, okay? The challenge is the, the hot boxes are not a bad idea, but from a cost effectiveness standpoint, you'll actually be surprised. The throw and roll can actually be more cost effective. How about in the summer? What do you think the answer is? And yes, you can use high performance material in a semi-permanent patch. What do you think in the summer is the best choice? Semi-permanent, yeah, semi-permanent. Yeah, the plant, do the semi-permanent patch, absolutely. Yep, okay. Now, the truth is, the difference in price between all three techniques isn't as much as most people think. If you do them well, all three of them are actually very, very cost effective. So the spray patch is just behind throw and roll in the winter and actually surprisingly close to the semi-permanent. But what are you trying to do? choose based upon that and do it right, okay? So now I want to end the last 
uh, 15 minutes or so. Actually, we got about 18 minutes, so I'll leave a few minutes for questions. We'll talk about thin wearing courses. Some people call this seals, some people call this chip seals, uh, surface treatments, all kind of words are used. I like the idea of a wearing course because its whole purpose primarily is the surface to wear, okay? This is chapter eight in the main book if you've downloaded it. This is a slurry seal, okay, on a state highway over top of asphalt. Why do we put down wearing courses? Well. The primary reason, the reason we call them seals, is to seal and protect the pavement, okay? Maybe we should do that on the side of our trucks, you know? There's to protect and serve, to seal and protect, that'd be pretty good. To escort, uh, provide skid resistant surface by using good aggregates. And some states have had problems in the past, and by the way, New York has had that problem way in the past, where rocks weren't able to handle the traffic and they got too polished. New York State's got a pretty good policy, so be happy. If you're using a skid-resistant rock, you're going to have a skid-resistant surface if you've got everything else right. You can restore the oxidized surface on the pavement. And then in some cases, you can fill minor ruts. And that's in italics, and we'll come back to why. You can't fill ruts with all wearing courses, okay? But make sure is ask for a high friction. That's the key. Now, in terms of what's a good candidate, most of the time we do crack repairs too late, we do seals too late as well. You actually wanna seal it before you start seeing the cracks. Maybe a few very minor ones, okay? In fact, a good thing to look for is on a day when it's been moist at night and it starts to evaporate, you don't get that nice dark sheen, all of a sudden it's dry, it starts to give this sort of open look to it, okay? What that means is it's lost permeability, or it's increased permeability. The water is now going down through the asphalt, and that's what you want to stop. So you want to seal it. And so what we want to do is a common wearing courses, from sand seals to chip seals, to all the way up to thin overlays. The key is they don't provide any structural support. They're just sealing the surface. Now, a sand seal is made with sand. And if people go, well, why would I use a sand seal? You can actually cheat a little bit and combine these techniques together. In fact, if you do a slurry seal and a chip seal, they call that a cape seal as an example. You could do a chip seal with a sand seal. And this is actually what you can get. This is a uh, state highway here in New York and uh, looks pretty darn good. In fact, if we do a close up, it looks like hot mix. A good quality wearing course will last for a really, really long time if done well assuming you've got good drainage underneath, okay? And again, I'd go watch the video, uh, the one that Gary did on uh, wearing courses. Got a beautiful couple of good videos showing this. I'm gonna take a risk with one here in a minute, but we'll see if it plays. But the thing I want you to do, if you're doing anything with a chip seal or a sand seal, that distributor truck with those fans, by the way, just like we saw in the old picture from over a hundred years ago, and the distributor of the rocks, whether it's the, distributor truck or the back end of the trucks themselves, keep that distance short, okay? Lynn always liked to say, Lynn Irwin always liked to say, I need to have a rope between the guy driving the distributor and the guy driving the spray truck so they didn't get too far apart, okay? Now, a slurry seal, you, it's all contained in one spot, okay? And everything gets mixed together in a pug mill at the back end of the system, and they keep feeding the hoppers with aggregate and a filler, something to help it set up faster. All of your stuff gets put together, mixed together, and then put down into a bag out the back. And you drag this down the roadway, and it could be with or without polymer. We start adding polymers, we get into something people call microsurfacing or micro paving, okay? Very, very similar, but a slightly different material, okay? Uh, somebody asked a question, what are your opinions now that polymers are available for oil and stone? Well, again, much in the same way that a slurry seal is good for sealing the surface, a micropaving gives you a little bit of additional benefit with the polymer. There's some things you can do with it. The polymers give you some different situations you can use them in. Plus, they can increase the ability to handle different weather extremes. If you're in the North Country, for instance, I would think about polymers. If you've got a lot of traffic, think about polymers. But you've got to look at the cost benefit. If it's a couple of percentage points more, almost always worth it. You start getting more than that, you gotta look at the situation, okay? I like polymers if they're used properly, okay? 
Now, microsurfacing, again, I'll show you the difference, but microsurfacing was originally developed in Germany on the German Autobahn. It was designed to fill ruts. That was its primary purpose, in fact, okay? So you can actually see it. Now, in this case, they're doing it in a two-pass system. One pass fills the ruts, a second pass is designed to make the surface completely sealed, okay? And we're gonna take our risk, we'll see if our video plays here. I know there's no sound because I turned the sound off on this one. So this is a longer video from the International Slurry Surfacing Association. But what I want you to really watch is look at the color. The color and the back end of any of these slurries or micro paving or anything like that should be brown, okay? Much in the same way that as a chip seal or a sand steel, I want to get the stones on it while it's still brown. The slurry should be brown when it's coming back out. If it's brown, when you put it down, you'll be happy, okay? Now, Nova chip, uh, Nova chip is also called in the New York State DOT specifications, paver placed surface treatment, because that's what it is. It's a specialized technique to essentially put a one stone thick layer of essentially hot mix. Okay, it can be very, very effective, but it's still a wearing course. Okay, now the thing I like about this particular photograph, you'll notice they've actually done some crack repairs ahead of time. How soon before the Nova chip is placed or a slurry or a chip seal, but how soon before the wearing course is placed should you have been doing those crack repairs? What do you think? A month? six months, 10 to 14 days, previous year, okay? The key is you've got to give that crack repair plenty of time to cure, which really means at least a season, okay? If you can do it the previous year, great, but at least a full season, okay? The key is if you don't and it cures, it can actually come up through and cause some damage to you. So if you can do it the season, so if you're doing it now, a really good job would be to do your wearing courses midsummer, giving it a couple of months or a season to cure out. Okay. Now, notice they've got a built in spray bar. They're still using a tack coat. Anytime you use hot mix, you need a tack coat. And that's true even with a micro paving. And you can actually see the brown emulsion being put down before the quote unquote hot mix comes down. Okay. Now, People go, well, I can overlay it with a thin lift 6.3 millimeter hot mix, super pave. It's still a wearing course. Unless it's more than about, oh, an inch thick, it's not adding any structural strength. And actually, one of the things about thin overlays is it actually doesn't fill ruts. Micropave and Nova chip are designed in such a way that you can fill some minor ruts. And we're talking up to maybe three quarters of an inch for the macro pave, unless you do something special. Um, they were designed for that. A thin overlay won't because when you try to fill in a rut with a thin overlay, it might be flat the day you did it, but what's going to happen over time? Traffic is going to come along, probably in the same spot where the rut was before, and it's going to re-rut it. So thin overlays actually don't fill the ruts like most people think, okay? Do I advocate for built-in spray bars to minimize tack tracking? I minimize, I'm a fan of tack coat. Uh, I want tack coat on anything with hot mix, um, get it down. But if remember, if you're using a built-in bar, you've got to use a different tack because you don't want to use the same tack that you would use if you're doing it, spraying it ahead of time. They make tackless tacks, okay? But keep that in mind, okay? So if somebody asked about with this thin lift, could you do a two inch thickness? You could. Um, but again, that's a lot of money. Why not put down a two inch thick lift of a bigger stone uh, lift and then wear, put a wearing course on top of that. But again, the ruts may come back unless you do it with a rut fill first, okay? Now chip seals, just as an example, since they're the most common wearing course we use, here's the game plan. We're gonna sweep, we're gonna spray, we're going to spread, we're going to squish, and we're going to sweep, okay? Okay, we would actually call that rolling, but I wanted five S's just to have a little bit of fun. Uh, sweep, spray, spread, squish, sweep, okay? And how quickly after I've rolled the stones in should I sweep? 
Same day, next day, a couple of weeks, next year? What do you think? Same day, two weeks, a few days. What you're waiting for, for anything with a chip seal, not hot mix we're talking, but we're talking emulsions, is you need the emulsion to break, okay? And what happens is when you put the emulsion down, the reason it's brown, it's a mixture of water and oil, really. And that's why it's got a brownish look to it. What you want to do is you want to wait for that material to break and it turns black. Then you can go ahead and sweep it. So you don't want to do it until it's got enough embedment by traffic, but you don't want to uh, wait so long that it actually can re-loosen itself. So general rule of thumb, end of the next day is probably the latest you want to do it. Um, depends how much time you've got. I probably wouldn't do it at three o'clock in the afternoon and do it at four. That's not enough time. But you definitely don't want to be waiting two weeks, which is what we used to do a long time in the past. We want to get that swept up, okay, fairly quickly. Because remember, what you're really putting down is an emulsion, which is a mixture of water and asphalt in a fine suspension. When it breaks, it breaks into its constituent components, okay? You've now got water, you've got asphalt. The water is still there. It's going to take a little bit of time for that water to evaporate, which is another reason we should be doing this early. So to end this seg segment, let me ask you, what are the most common reasons for premature failure of a chip seal? They did a study. What do you think were the top four? What do you think? Put that in the Q&A pod. Let's see what y'all come up with. What are the top four? Late season work. That's, that's a good one. Too cold, which would be late season work, because early season two, by the way. Yep. Not properly cleaning the surface, delamination. Some good answers. Okay. Let's go through the list. Dirty aggregate. Okay, here we go. Number one. Yep, the wrong weather. Number two, improper emulsion application rate. Improper aggregate application rate. Okay. Uh, somebody here says our policy is to wait no more than, than a couple hours to sweep the chip seal because of liability with vehicle damage. If you're not using too much down pressure, you can probably get away with that. Uh, be careful that you don't over sweep and actually reduce uh, the coverage by the stone. So it's, I can understand that policy. Just be careful you don't damage the chip seal. And then number four, placing the stone too late. And what I mean by placing the stone too late is actually that point of the spreader and the distributor, keep them close to each other. So in terms of weather, air temperature above 50, Pavement temperature greater than 70, less than 130. If it's too hot, you can get a flash set. But the key is good temperature, lower humidity than you might think, no chance of rain, and you gotta be careful about the wind. Now, if it's obviously, if it's just always been windy, you can adjust for that, but you certainly don't want changes in the wind. Good rule of thumb. If people are out haying in the field, you might think about putting down a wearing course. In terms of asphalt application, if you put down too much, you're going to get bleeding. That's not good. What you really want to see with the rocks is a little bit of asphalt sticking up, but not too much. Okay, if you got too much, you're going to get bleeding. What happens if you get too little asphalt? What happens if you get too little asphalt? Let's see if somebody answers this one. Stone loss. And if you lose stone, that means you're back to having emulsion and you're going to have bleeding. The great irony is if too much or too little of either emulsion or stone and you wind up with bleeding, okay? Because the stones don't adhere. But I'll tell you, this is the one that may be, I think the most frustrating. It's too late, okay? It's way too late now, okay? I don't care if it's a breakdown or why, but once that emulsion is black, you're not going to get the stones to stick at the rate you need them to stick. In fact, here's a picture that was, uh, I had the black and white version for many years and I always thought, oh, it's a beautiful picture of a nice distribution of, in this case, a, a very fine stone. Um, but I got a color version of the picture and look at the emulsion, it's black. If it's black, send it back, it's too late. You need it brown, okay? And again, there's some good videos, go on the information highway and look for that. 
but a chip seal roadway can be a paved roadway. And you're going, wait a second, Dave, this isn't New York. Yeah, I know, this is the Forest Service Road in the National Park, okay? But this is a state highway in New York. It's got a wearing course on it. Now, I wish I had more time. We could talk about things like uh, fancy polymer coated things and fiber reinforced SAMIs and all kind of fun stuff, okay? But I just don't have time for that today. But what we're gonna end with for the last couple of minutes here, uh, Go ahead and put your questions in the question pod, but I'm gonna ask you to choose on these quick pictures I'm gonna show you, which of the maintenance techniques would you choose? You got five choices, okay? I'm gonna do nothing or drainage, or I'm gonna choose one of my three repairs we talked about today. I suppose actually a sixth choice. I'm gonna do something more extensive, okay? So what am I gonna do here? And this, by the way, somebody asked a question, if the emulsion is already broken, how would you do it over? Can new emulsion be placed over black emulsion? The same problem we get with the bleeding road. What are you gonna do here? You could try a wearing course. The danger with nothing is a uh, liability if it's too slippery. You can try a chip seal where you reduce the amount of emulsion to deal with the extra oil that you've got in the system. Uh, the problem with if you get that wrong, it'll still bleed. A micro pave or an overlay will give you some time, but again, you have to design it for the amount of extra emulsion, extra asphalt sitting on that surface. You've got to get someone in there to help you design it, okay? Some agencies have had some success where they've micro milled it or they've reduced and they've milled out the top inch or two as well. Bleeding is really hard to fix. How about this one? Yay, nothing, yay. <laughs> uh, how about this one? Is this a candidate for crack repairs? Yes or no, what do you think? Is that a candidate for crack repairs? No, no. Again, imagine trying to draw those in. There's too many of them, okay? At this point, you're probably gonna have to mill that out, okay? It's a little bit too late. How about this one? This is a candidate for crack repairs? That's a candidate for patching, yes. I agree with you on patching. Maybe a mill and fill. But remember, what did I say early on with our questions? How's the drainage? Right there? That's actually water coming out. You've got to take care of the drainage, okay? Somebody said, by the way, that's artistic. My favorite one, I can't find the picture. It's frustrating. I wish I could find a picture. Somebody had done this on the pavement with the asphalt emulsion, okay? And then uh, one last one, I'll skip this one. I'm just gonna show you one last one. Is this a candidate for a wearing course? It's one of those ones that can fill ruts? Yeah, no, it's too, too, too deep, okay? You gotta figure out where the rut is. It's a wide rut, it's probably deeper down, but remember the maximum you're gonna fill is about half inch, maybe three quarter, it's too late, okay? So am I gonna be able to do our maintenance on this or is it something more extensive? Yeah, I gotta look at the drainage. Most of the time when we start seeing large amounts of cracks, we gotta think about the drainage, we gotta think about what's underneath, okay? And with that, I'm gonna just because of time, I'm gonna go ahead and be nice to you. And uh, hopefully you all agree we can't do maintenance in weather like this. Remember to fix the cause of the distress, not the effect, okay? And uh, I thank you for the, uh, dealing with me for an hour. Uh, we do have, uh, we're gonna be doing our Stump the Engineers. This time we're doing it via Facebook Live, but email your questions, we're doing that tomorrow. Uh, preparing an asset management plan, as I mentioned to you, is on Thursday. Uh, you'll hear from me on the bumper banter next Monday, and then we're doing a work zone session next Tuesday, and we're looking at our June schedule. So if you have any ideas or thoughts, please let me know. And if you wouldn't mind, I have one last poll for you to help us out. I'm gonna launch here. We're looking at our June schedule. Uh, would you like us to keep the same schedule of having three things a week, or should we just do one or two of these? And if we are, please click on what you think you'd like to see us do.
and you can do multiple choice on this. And with that, if you have any questions, put them in the pod. Otherwise, uh, have yourself a great afternoon. But please answer before you hit the road. Okay, I'll, I'll show the results to everybody and uh, for those who stayed on. And uh, you certainly like the Tuesday webinars, so uh, that's what we were sort of thinking of anyway. Well, and we'll play it by ear and see about the two Thursday and Wednesdays. Thanks for all the advice. Thanks for the help. But again, if you have topics, let us know and have yourself a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.